Hello, everyone, and welcome back. We're going to talk about continuous measurement. So these are ways we can collect data. So you're going to learn two. You're going to learn continuous measurement and discontinuous measurement. And so I'm going to talk about the differences between those two before getting started. Continuous measurement records every instance of behavior, while discontinuous measurement misses some behavior. This is used for high priority behaviors or when precision is critical. When precision is critical, you want to use continuous measurement. You also, you know, it's, we move to discontinuous when there's sort of time constraints with the observer. If there's no time constraints, then you do want to always use continuous. <laughs> Discontinuous measurement captures snapshots of behavior. There are interval recording systems. So you're just looking at little sampled views of behavior and generating percentages. It's much easier to do in fast paced environments. Continuous measurement is a lot harder to do, but we use it for very frequent behaviors when the target behavior happens frequently, when there's a clear beginning and end. So if the behavior doesn't have a clear beginning and end, sometimes discontinuous will be easier to analyze that once you have all your data. When a behavior has a clear start and stop point, we also want exact timing or frequency when precision tracking is needed and precise data for treatment. Especially with really severe behaviors, we might want to use continuous because we want really good tracking. We want to know if the intervention is working right away because it's a dangerous behavior and we want to get it under, get it handled quickly, quicker. You other ones are those frequent ones. It's just so much easier to do frequency when it's a frequent behavior. So we're going to talk about a couple different types of continuous measurement you can use. The first type is frequency. This is super easy. It is simply a tally count of behavior. So you just mark down when the behavior is occurring. So, and the number of times it occurs during the observation period, you can break your observation period into, you know, middle, beginning, end, so you'll have more data on when it was occurring, but it also can just be a tally count within one 20-minute observation period. You want to use this when you have low to moderate frequent behaviors. If it's too high, it gets difficult. If it's very rare, it also gets difficult. These are typically shorter behaviors like raising your hand. Examples are asking for help, hitting, saying no. Anything short that's going to happen at a low to moderate frequency would be the best for a frequency count. Now, with our frequency count, we also have something called rate. Rate is a measurement that calculates the frequency of behavior over a period of time. So it helps track behaviors when the session length vary, allows for comparison across different times. So how we calculate rate, it's simply a math problem once you have a frequency count. You're going to bring it to a certain time period. So if it depends on what you're, I'll give you a couple examples, but you're either going to bring it down to one day, one hour, one minute, and every once in a while you might want to do one second, but not very often. So for example, if you observed over 10 hours and in those 10 hours, the child hit 10 times. You don't know where in those 10 hour period, like you observe three hours on Tuesday, one hour on Wednesday, four hours on Thursday. When you add them all up, you have 10 times they hit. And when you look at the hours, you observed a total of 10 hours. Now, because the observations are all over the place, it's really hard. You don't know what to say. Like this observation, I saw them hit three times. This one, I saw them hit once. But how do we measure? How do we do it? You could say they hit about 10 times every 10 hours. But that's not super meaningful because nobody's going to observe a full 10 hours. So you pull it down to one. How many times do they hit within a one hour? So it's a direct 10 over 10. So they hit once per hour. Now we can do a lot with that. Once per hour, we can observe and go it's reduced or it's increased. If you 
Observe an hour and you see them hit three times, the behavior increase. If you don't see them hit at all in that hour, it's probably decreased. So by taking it down to the one hour mark, we can use it, we can look at it, compare it, work with it. So here's another example of that for minutes. So you observe two hours, so we'll say 120 minutes. And in that 120 minutes, they hit 200 times. Sorry, that doesn't make sense. So within the 120 minutes, we can say they hit 10 times. So they hit 10 times over two hours. See, I would take that down to an hour. So they're hitting five per hour. A lot of times it's hours. It's sort of hard to get examples that make sense for minutes. It has to be a very high frequency behavior. So let's say you did observe 120 minutes. So you observed two hours. And in that 120 minutes, you saw them hand flap 200 times. So they're flapping a lot. So you would go 200 divided by 120 and you get 1.6. So they're hand flapping about 1.6 per minute. So um, you could round that to one and a half times per minute. And so then if you really want to get that hand flapping down, you could work with that minute. But most of the time we're taking it either to an hour or a day is usually most meaningful with the behaviors we work with. If you're working with such high frequency behaviors that you're working with minutes, you're usually in a clinic with really severe behaviors. So when to use it? When session durations are inconsistent, you'll use rate to compare behavior across different sessions. When you need to compare behavior across days, so rate provides a standardized unit of measurement to track progress over time and tracks efficiency of behavior change. Rate can show if interventions are improving the frequency of behavior per unit of time. When you're doing rate, you add up all your frequency and all your observation timing, you take it down, you do a division problem that will take your unit of time to one. Our second type is duration. Duration refers to the total time a behavior lasts. We start the stopwatch when the behavior starts and stop it when it stops. This is for longer lasting behaviors where the length of time is more meaningful. For example, if you were sitting in a meeting and someone said, hey, she has a tantrum about once a week, and let's say she's a kindergartner. The tantrum once a week isn't great for a kindergartner. I know a lot that never had one at school, but it's also not that bad. You're thinking once a week, that's kind of manageable. But so they only took a frequency count on her tantrums. But then if you took duration, that tantrum lasted a whole hour at school. So about once per week, she has approximately an hour tantrum that doesn't end. Now that's very important because she lost an hour of learning time. She was in a state of distress for an hour. That means I want to work on that behavior a lot more than, you know, she has a five minute tantrum once a week. Maybe we can just accommodate for that and give her some space. That's when duration is important. Things like social engagement with others, it might be important. You're just tracking it and you say, hey, when I track it with frequency, you know, five times out of the week, they engage in social play with others. But if you take duration, that social play only lasts one to two minutes. And we'll say they're in kindergarten, you know, that's kind of low for social engagement. Maybe we do want to work with that. So once you know the duration, it changes the picture and might change what you do with it. So when the length of time matters more than the frequency, when you take duration, you also get frequency. It is the most complete way to take data because you start the stopwatch, stop it, and you have a time. And then when the behavior happens again, you start and stop again. So when that's going on, you're also one count, two counts. You can just count out how many times it occurred. So you also get frequency. Track behaviors with meaningful duration. So it's good to look at things like tantrums, engagement, screaming. Provides precise data on the behavior pattern. So it gives you the most precise data because you get frequency and duration with it.
Okay, latency. Latency is its own sort of special thing. The next one is IRT, which relates to duration. So frequency, duration, and IRT are these general ones we use. And then latency is sort of a special one. It's the time between a cue and the start of a behavior. It measures reaction time or prompt dependence, and it's useful for tracking compliance, reduced delays in responding, and monitoring hesitation or processing time. Okay, so if everyone's like, oh, non-compliance, you might want to use this if people are throwing around that word or refusal. Anytime someone's talking about, hey, I tell him what to do and he doesn't do it, or I tell him what to do, it takes them a really long time to do it. So all it is is you start the stopwatch when the cue is given, the SD, the direction, and you stop it once the behavior starts. So, hey, everybody take out your math book and open to page 100. You would start the stopwatch when the teacher said that and then stop it when the child took out their math workbook. Sometimes they never do. You don't have latency yet. You have to start building a little compliance to even get the latency. This is interesting data to take if people are complaining that they're taking too long to follow directions or they're not following directions. We would try to make that smaller and smaller. And in the skills section, we'll talk about the ways we might make that smaller. When to use, it's a measure of compliance pretty much for you. Reduce delays in responding. So it's that delay that we're interested in. If that's the sort of behaviors you're looking at, then you would l use this. When I'm doing school psych assessment, it can be looked at as a measure of processing. So when someone gives you a direction, a lot of things happen. There's an auditory component. The person's hearing the direction. From the auditory, it goes to auditory memory. From auditory memory, it has to go to regular memory and then to kinesthetic to do what you are being asked to do. So that's all very complex processing and some kids have trouble with processing. And so sometimes I utilize it to sort of get an idea of processing speed on a child. So that's not really... That's something to keep in mind because sometimes people just need longer to follow directions. If that's the student you're working with, maybe we don't need to work on re reducing that latency and we can just work on making the environment tolerate the time they need for processing. So it's just something to keep in mind. I have used it in that way. Inner response time is called IRT. This is the time between the end of one behavior and the start of another. You start the stopwatch when the behavior ends and stop it when the next instance of behavior starts. This helps to slow down repetitive or rapid behavior. So we can use it to teach longer intervals between repetitive behaviors like self-injury, excessive eating or chewing, we can teach longer intervals between responses. It might be something you take data on for a self-stimulatory behavior. You might not even be working with the self-stimulatory behavior, but you might just take it for information to sort of see how much self-stimulatory time someone might need to engage in their behaviors. This is the one you'll use the very least. I've had very few instances where I needed to take this data. But I like showing everyone this chart. The top is duration. So that's the duration of dog barking behavior. It's a timeline. So from we'll just make it up because there's no numbers. But from like minute four to minute five, the dog was barking. From minute one to minute four, they were not. So when the dog's not barking, a little bit lower, that is your IRT. So your duration's right on the top and your IRT is right below where the dog's not barking. I like showing this because when you add duration and IRT all together, you get the total length of the observation period. If you have one, you have the other automatically. You can calculate the other. If I have the start and stop of those three dog barking behaviors, I can calculate the time they were barking, which is the IRT, and vice versa. If I had the time they were barking, then I can calculate the time they were barking, as long as I have the total length of the observation, which you should have for any observation. You can calculate that. So continuous measurement is a data collection method that records every instance of a target behavior during an observation period. This is complete and accurate picture of the behavior. 
And so we learned about frequency, how to take rate from frequency, duration, and IRT, and latency. Okay, thank you.